Now I'm going to um, share a couple of things with you today. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So we see from that that it's Jesus is building his church. I know it's an old truth. We've all heard it before. But, you know, God's not really saying a lot that's new. He's just trying to get something through. And the more we hear it, the more it starts to sink in. But Jesus is building his church. And this, this church that he's building, it's, it's, not, it's not just a denomination, although it does have denominations in it. And I know, um, as I speak to different people, even like this lady that I shared before, how uh, she wants to come along to church, or that when, when we talk about church to people that are outside the church, sometimes they have a very different concept to what we see as a church. And uh, a lot of, I've, I've had people say, well, I don't believe in God. What do you do when someone says, I don't believe in God? My usual response is, well, what sort of God don't you believe in? And then they'll start to talk about some bad things that have happened and all the rest of it. And so well, I say, well, I, wouldn't, I don't believe in that sort of God either. I believe in a God who loves me. And he gave his life for me and he actually came to me. And so I try to, to swing it around. So the church he's building is not a denomination. The church he's building is not an organisation, although a church has to have some sort of organisational structure. We have a, we have a roster there that we have uh, our whole duty teams. And most of us are not even aware that a lot of that stuff goes on. The only time you notice it is when it doesn't happen. If someone forgets they're on, then you notice it. But a lot of things that happen, we, we don't notice. Like it's... What would happen one Sunday if we go to and we say, well, okay, now it's time for communion. We go there and the, and the elements haven't been done. So it all takes organisation. Someone has to do it. Someone does the, the washing up afterwards and everything else. And it's, it's really great to see how often, I find out there, how often just people, even though they're not rostered on, they'll just muck up and they'll, and they'll, or just step in and they'll do it. The church is not a bureaucracy either, although it has various departments and one of them meets tomorrow is the, the mothers of preschoolers. You have your, your ladies meeting, you have your music department, you have your youth department and all that, all so on. There's all aspects of it. But the church that Jesus is building is, is really the emphasis is on the people, the people that are born again of his spirit, living for him. And the, these people are actually the physical expression of Jesus Christ to the world. So we are the phys physical expression. Now, none of us can express all that Christ is to the world. None of us by ourselves can do that. But we all express a little bit. And so the more people, that, the more of us that come in contact with someone, the, the more full expression, I suppose, that they're going to get of Jesus in their life. So to be, be Christ in the community or to the community, I believe there are really there are three fundamental things that we need to know. Firstly, we need to know who we are. Who are you? I've had people say to me, who do you think you are? And they mean it in a different way to the way I think I am, but it's important that we, we get a grasp and I'm, I'm continuing to grow in the knowledge of, of who I am. I haven't got a, a full grasp of who I am, but I've got a bit of a grasp of who I am. Secondly, we need to know who Christ, we need to know Christ and we need to have an awareness of his presence with us. So what's... What's the Christ that you know like? What is he like? Is he someone who, if you don't measure up, he cracks up at you? It may be, we may sort of think of him as, as the sort of the heavenly father that a bit like our natural dad who when we did things wrong, we got a belt and, and we really got, you know, 
I mean, I, I learned to touch my toes at school. It was bend over, touch your toes, T-square across the backside. Um, kept me pretty flexible. I can still bend over and touch my toes. But what's the Jesus that you know like? Then is, is there anything that, that we can do that would maybe um, stimulate an awareness of his presence? Because he says there's nowhere we can go that he's not present. But we're not always aware of his presence, are we? We're not always conscious of it. And we don't like to think of it. We don't like to think of the fact when we're sitting on the toilet, he's there. We don't like to think of that sort of thing. Well, when we're under the shower, he's there. When we're out cutting the grass, he's there. When we're out working, he's there. He's always there, but we're not conscious or aware of his presence. So is there anything that we can do that would help to make us perhaps a little bit more aware that he's there? And uh, a third thing that I think is, is pretty important is to, to know how the Holy Spirit operates in our life. Now, John fourteen twenty six tells us that the, the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I've said to you. And I can remember someone saying to me years ago, we don't need a teacher, we've got the Holy Ghost. But scripture says that God has put apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers in the church to help us to grow. So whilst it's the Holy Spirit that actually teaches us, I believe he, he sh- sort of shines the light on the truth. We still need vessels that will teach. In youth group, they teach the truths of God to the young people out here, they're doing that this morning in Sunday school and, and, and the older group out there. Um, but it's the Holy Spirit that actually quickens it and makes it from just being a, a written letter to a word that's alive within their heart. And we all need a word that's alive within our heart. So the Holy Spirit's the promised comforter and guide for us. And as part of the Godhead, I think it helps if we can understand the, the consistent principles and patterns um, that he works within us. Now, as a, as a new believer, some people say, you, you just need the word of God, you know, you need the word. But I remember as a, as a new believer, there was a, a wise old preacher. He gave me some trust, a trust what I think has been a, an anchor for my life. And he said, without the spirit, without the word you blow up. Without the word, without the spirit, you dry up. But the spirit and the word, you grow up. And I think that's a good truth. It's important that we, we don't just get so focused on, on the word that we miss the Holy Spirit as well. Now, the Holy Spirit, to many of it, in a lot of ways, is a bit mystical. And we'll say, oh, well, God, God speaks to us through his word. But how do we hear his word? And we need the Holy Spirit to, to work to bring that truth. So to grow, we need the word and the Holy Spirit working in tandem with us. So as we go on this morning, I, I want to just focus on one aspect of those fundamental truths. But let's just... Let's just pray and ask the Lord to, to help us because if, if the Holy Spirit doesn't take even the words that I speak today, it's just words. It's just maybe just my opinion. And I, I don't want it to be that. I want to be a vessel that, that the Lord can speak to us. And whilst everything I say is not going to go and, and take root, certainly some of it will. So Lord, as we come here today, we come with a heart that's open. We, we want to receive of your word. I, I'm mindful of the, of the parable of the sower, that the seed is sown. And, and Lord, I want to be a fertile ground that you sow your seed into. And water it with your spirit, I pray. Cause this word that's spoken today to germinate within us and to make us more effective is your body in the world that we're in, in Jesus' name. Can you say amen to that? 
Amen. So, I guess the question is, who are you? Who are you? Dig deep enough and you'll find within everyone there's a longing for meaning and purpose. I think everybody at some time wonders, you know, why am I here? Is there a purpose for my life? And I remember at the age of 29, I was working in um, Dandenong. We were living in Frankston and, um, and I was thinking, what, what am I here for? What's, what's my life about? I was trying to be, an emphasis on the trying to be, a good father, a good husband, a good provider, all things that are, that are good to do. But I was trying to do them and, and I was trying to do my job well and, and I was driven by a, a desire to do everything to, to aspire to perfection and their good aspirations. I got a lot of, um, I guess I got a lot of personal sense of value out of doing what I did really well. So much so that when I did an invoice, I'd I'd check it two or three times to make sure it didn't have a mistake in it. And I worked with a guy who I reckon he would be pretty rare that he actually wrote an invoice out that he didn't have a mistake on it. He couldn't have cared less. And the annoying thing was he got paid as much as I got paid. And I just didn't think it was it. So there were a lot of things I was thinking about. What, what's the point? Why am I being a decent guy? Why am, I, why am I not doing what a lot of other people do? Why am I doing this? And it was around that time um, my brother actually gave his heart to the Lord and mum said, watch him, he's got religion. And uh, she said, he needs it, you don't. And uh, I said to him, I said, Chris, what's, what's this you've got religion? He said, I haven't got religion. He said, I found the truth. Truth, truth about what? Didn't understand really what he meant. But um, I did come to know afterwards what he meant. Have you ever been asked what you want to be when you grow up? I can remember being asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I think what they were saying is, is there anything particularly you'd like to do when you grow up? I mean... To, we, we so much associate what we do with who we are. Uh, when I was actually in um, full-time ministry in, in our last church as, as the pastor there, um, they'd say, well, this is Pastor Richard. And I'd say, well, you don't say it's uh, Plumber Joe or Carpenter Bob. That was, that was my function but I was Richard and that's what I happened to do. So I don't, I'm a bit funny, I don't see those things as titles, although sometimes we do use them as a, as a mark of respect and we certainly do with a doctor. Um, I'm not sure what we do with the solicitor, whether we say our solicitor so-and-so. Um, I haven't had to do too much with them. But we do sort of imply that, that what we do depicts who we are and different people search for I guess meaning and fulfillment in a variety of ways some search for it in a in a career and I think there are many fine vocations but they're hardly a justification for our existence some try to find meaning in their possessions and it might be to have a a nice car and I mean I, I like a nice car I'm pretty fortunate I've got a nice car but you've got to be very careful how you hold them because as some of you know here you can go around the corner and someone can plough into you and the car is no longer we had one ha- happened out the front of our place the other day lady minding her own business coming down the hill someone came through a giveaway sign and she hit him smack in the middle rode them both off and um, that's what can happen to a motor car so if you're getting your value out of having a nice motor car, your value may not last. Could be a house, could be clothes. I think most of us like to dress up. Uh, tendency with a lot of people these days, certainly men, is probably more to dress down than dress up. 
But, um, you know, the casual look is the in thing and uh, I'm a bit the same way. I was brought up when you're behind the platform, you always wear a tie, um, all those sorts of things and they're out, certainly out the window now. And, and I don't know, I, I think we went past the Mormon church this morning and I saw the guy out picking up some rubbish in his suit and well, it does look pretty smart, but it doesn't make any more holy. And so our value doesn't come out of, you know, what we're, what we're wearing. It doesn't come out of the latest TV or the latest gadget. I think I'd, I'd love one. I went round to Edward's place the other week and he's got one of these little Mickey Mouse ones that, that even plays the music for you. I thought, how good is that? I thought, Winnie and Edward, they're so lucky to have this thing and... My old plasma key was just a plain old plasma. I knew it was pretty good when I got it, but it's outdated. And, and that's, they sort of get you into that cycle, but uh, it's real. I know one day I'll want to have one of those things, but this one I've got can break down first. So I think the people who like those, who do those things for their, for their value, they're probably very good for the economy because they're always looking for something to to buy to feed their self-worth and it, you'll find some muse and I'm not saying anyone who necessarily is involved in sports or whatever that's why they're doing it but some do do their sport their sport becomes their whole life it's a whole identification some get inv- involved in cults some get involved in drugs they're all mirages in the, in the quest for purpose uh, they opt to be, I, I class them as their human doings, but we were created to be human beings and there's a big difference in that. John 8.32 says that you'll know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And that's what my brother said. He said, I found the truth. But what's this truth that he's talking about? Now, this truth can't be the law because Jesus was speaking in this passage to those that were actually under the law and that knew the law and that were actually fulfilling the obligations of the law, certainly as best as they could. So it couldn't be that that set them free because they still had the same problems as anyone else. And I think it's the truth of of grace, not the law, that actually brings true freedom. John 1.17 says that the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And when he speaks about grace here, I believe in a, in a sense he's talking about himself. And when this grace comes into us it makes us it it really does the cleansing work it's the grace of God I want to do something for you I'll put the mic down Um, I need someone to come and help me so Russell you're you're a good candidate here I've got to I've got to hold the bucket this is the spew bucket right (laughs) so you need to hold it with one hand and I'm going to try and do best. This is, this is like our life. I get, I've got this tremors. Lovely, isn't it? This is like our life. You hold it because you've got steady hand there. Can you hold both? You're a clever lad. He's, multi, he's multi-talented, isn't he? You'll need to hold it over the thing. That's like our life. We, we come to the Lord and, and, a lot of, and none of us are, have got it all out of us yet. But that's like our life. We... We've got a lot of muck in there. Who's got a lot of muck still in their life left? A few of us are honest. A few of us have still got a little bit left. And the grace of God comes by his spirit. The grace of God comes and he goes like this and he starts to... See what's happening? The, The muck's starting to go out. And this over a period of time he gets working within us and he keeps working within us. And thank you. Great job. We didn't get any on the floor. <laughs> we did well. For those who are listening to the tape, that's a little... You can just pop it in there. It'll be fine. Thanks, Russ. Um, for those who are listening on the tape, it's hard. But we had a, 
we had a glass with some coffee in it and we just poured some water in it and made it go clean. But Ephesians 2, 4 and 5 says this. It says, God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved. It's not a, it's not a works deal. It's, we're human beings. We're not human doings. And I, I like to suggest to you that as we come to know who we are in Christ, the more we get washed with his word, the more of the, our old wrong thinking, and you could picture a lot of that cloudy stuff in the glasses, a lot of our wrong, the wrong way we think, a lot of those things are just washed out as his, he reveals his word by his grace. It works within us. And the more we come to know or as we come to know who we are in Christ, we begin to understand our true value and worth before God. We are of amazing value in God's eyes. And I just think we, we did that song earlier today and we spoke of the cross and I, and I just think, God, you are so good. The, we worship the God of the only faith where he actually came down to us. Every other faith, they're trying to do stuff. They're trying to control, particularly in the Middle East now, you've got, and it's happening all throughout the world, they're trying to control people's lives by by violence and force. And yet here we have a God who loves us so much that he came even when we were steeped in as sinners by nature. And he came and he did it for us, that focal point. Just amazing, I think. So what the, what are some of the things that are true for us as believers? Well, I, look, I don't profess to have all the answers. I've got a few of the answers, but I, I don't have a monopoly on truth. Some, pe- some of you guys probably know more than I do. But it's not about who knows the most. It's about we, we all want to know a little more about it was. So I jotted down a, a few things and, and this is by no means a comprehensive list and once I got to a couple of pages I thought Richard that's enough you've got to stop but I could have gone on and on and on but so I don't, I don't profess to have all the answers as I said but I, I do have some that I found in scripture and I want to share a few of them today with you. So as believers, we are, and and note the present tense, these are things that we are. These are not things that we're going to be, and you may not feel that these are true, but they're not true because we feel and they're true because that's what God says. He says they're true, therefore they are. So these things are not things that we will be, although they will be coming more real within our life. They are things that we are. Firstly, We're chosen, adopted and accepted. In Ephesians 1, you can read it with me, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. We should have that underlined. It was the good pleasure of God's will that he adopted us into his family. Now, I know we've got some folk in here that have foster children. They've brought the children into their family. But God actually did more than that. He brought us into his family and adopted us and said, now you are absolutely part of my family. That's pretty neat, I think. Even when we were dead in trespasses, he did that. He said, no, I want you. 
So he chose us. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of what? His grace, not our self-effort. So there's that word grace again. And I had a look in my um, uh, Bible program. It's pretty good to have these things on computers. In the old days I had to look up my concordance. And there, remember there were three co- concordances. There was the youngs for the youngs and there was the crudens for the crude and then what was the other one? I can't remember what the other Strong. Strongs for the strong, that's right. There were the, the three of them. And uh, I happen to actually have the three of them at home but in this Bible program I looked it up and I just put the word grace in. And you know what? Grace appears 39 times in the Old Testament and 131 in the New. There's a useless bit of information for you. Um, but... It's his grace that's worked within us. And, and I'm sensing that to try and set Jesus from the grace of God is very hard to do because, because really they're one and the same. When he comes, he comes in all his fullness. He comes in all his, his grace to us. We also see another thing that we are is we're new creations. Oh, I'm going well today. And I'd have to say, thanks, Paul. I don't know what you've did, but it's certainly working better. Um, But we're a brand new species of being. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I did put some of these things in here. If anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And in the Amplified Bible, it says that we have become a new creature altogether. The old, previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away. So our old moral and spiritual condition has passed away. But but hang on, I still have all those thoughts. And when I look in the mirror, I still don't see myself as that. But does that mean that it isn't so? Why is it so? Remember old Professor Sumner Miller used to say, why is it so? Well, it's so because God says it's so. The trouble is we're bombarded with so much stuff and we even listen listen to the radio just recently and there's some, um, he was an English bishop or one of these high up guys and they're talking to him about uh, creation in the book of Genesis and he says oh well we we just don't believe all that six day stuff now you know modern science has shown that it really it's it's progression of time and you know that's out the window now but as soon as you start doing that with the word of God you're in trouble because what do you keep and what do you discard It's either true or it's not true. Now, I don't know how God did it other than he said it and it was. Now, I do know that there was a find a few years ago. Now, I don't know if you remember seeing it, but an island actually popped up over a period of of a month or two. An island popped up in the middle of the ocean. And all the scientists got out there and they thought, this is wonderful, it's millions of years old. But it had only been there for a couple of months. But it looked a million years old and, the, and a, lot of the, um, a lot of the rock stuff in it was still soft. So it doesn't take millions and millions of years to produce. When you look at the, the fossils that are in, and we had the creation guy here recently, when you look at a fossil in these layers of sand, they say, oh, that happened over millions of years. Well, I've got news for you. You go and f- catch a fish, put it on the bank and leave it there for millions of years and you see what it ends up like. I can guarantee you within a week it's not there. And yet these things have been compressed and all they're all there. They had fish even with another fish in their mouth and they were just solidified and they were fossilised. And that's supposed, they tell us, this happened over millions of years. I remember when we were up in Queensland, we went to a... Um, up at Mount Morgan, 
which is an old gold mine, and um, and there's this there's this massive cavern, and it's hard to say how high it is because it's really hard to judge the distance. But it's probably probably twenty twenty meters high, and it's got dinosaur footprints on the roof. And um, their thing was, they said, well, they they walked in the soft land, and when this um, all this layer came over it and it squashed it, and then it when it washed away it left them in the rock and I thought yeah well that doesn't need millions of years to do it and, and there's lots of layers in the where you could sort of see where it looked to me like the layers where the water had gone down and if you go to the beach we actually did up at Marimbula a couple of years ago we were walking along the beach and you know how um, you get all the sand and how the ocean comes in you might get a big drop of sand and and then the beach, and I looked, and there was all these like lines. You could see where the, the tide had sort of come in and washed away, but it effect, left all these lines. And that's exactly what it looked like in that big cavern. And we've got the guide telling us that this happened over millions of years. All of these things are all sort of like years, like the lines in a tree. And I just, and I said to him, I don't want to be argumentative, but how come there's no dirt in between them? And they looked at me a bit strange. And they come up with a... They've got an answer because that's what they're programmed with. But as soon as we start doubting the word of God, what parts do you hold and what parts don't you hold? So I'm a, I take the scripture literally where I can. I take it figuratively where you can't take it any other way. I don't think you can take it all as symbolic. Some of it is symbolic. A bit like the elements we had today. They symbolise to us the body of Christ. Some churches say that that becomes a physical Christ. I don't accept that. But how do we, how do we see the word of God? The old me, according to scripture, is dead. The old you, according to scripture, is dead. Someone who didn't exist has now come into being. The mistakes of your past, this is something we need to hear. The mistakes of our past no longer determine our future. Jesus came to give us a future and a hope. And when we're going through stuff, as I know different ones within us are, because that's the nature of life, we're all going through stuff from time to time. The mistakes we've made are not what determine our future. It's the fact that we have a living Christ within us. That's what determines our future. Whatever it is that kept us bound, Jesus came to set us free. Galatians 2.20, one of those scriptures that I remembered very early days and it says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet it's not I who lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. The faith that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. Does that mean that I'm on cloud nine all the time? It probably should, but it doesn't. I experience the same things as anyone else experiences I noticed even today and I thought what a wimp I am doing up the button on my shirt and where I clocked my finger the other week when I was over with Rick the jolly thing still hurts and here was Jesus crucified on the cross and he didn't even give a gripe I deserved it I I hit it so I couldn't blame anyone else Jesus didn't deserve it but he didn't grumble or complain Another thing we are, so we're chosen, we're adopted, we're accepted, we're new creations, we're born again. 1 Peter one twenty three says, Having been born again of incorruptible seed through the word of God which lives and abides to e- forever. The word of grace that works in us won't decay. It's not something that decays. Last year I grew some pumpkins 
and they were quite nice pumpkins and I put them in on the shelf and uh, went out to get one one day and jolly thing it started going rotten. It was subject to decay. But the word of God that works and lives and abides in us doesn't decay. It will accomplish what it sets forth to do eventually. I remember, I think it was Nancy Harkin once said, she said, all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose eventually. That was missed out. And we can't see it when we're in the midst of a dealing or something that's going on. We can't see those things. But it doesn't mean it's not happening. The evolutionists tell us that evolution is happening so slow we can't see it, but it's still happening. I mean, that's what I call blind faith. I think the greatest miracle is that, you know, I gave my heart to Jesus and he made me a new person. That is an incredible miracle, I think. We are forgiven. 1 John 2.12, he says, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. When we come to Christ, we're brought into a healthy relationship, not only with him, but he brings us into relationship with others. Now, this I'd say to you, you know, you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. We're family. So, Russell stuck with me as a brother. Tough luck. Bill stuck with me as a brother. Tough luck. Joe, she's my sister. Same Heavenly Father. We're stuck together. Now, we may not, you may not necessarily choose me, but the fact is, you don't have to because He has. And so we're all part of the family. Pretty good stuff. God's, God's a family man. Like I said to you before, he's, he's, he's got to be the greatest conservationist out because he doesn't waste anything. He works with it and he even works with us. Now, if I'd, have been, if I'd have been the one building the church, I probably wouldn't have chosen me. I think I would have chosen some people that are a bit better at it than I. But, no, God knows what he's doing. God hasn't made a mistake yet. I used to think I was the first mistake he made. But, but I wasn't, and neither are you. And sometimes we'll say, well, God, why did you make me like this? Wrong question. Wrong question. Just say, thank you, God, for making me the way I am. We're now in a healthy relationship, not only with him, but with one another. Sure, we have to do some things. To Scripture tells us that we are to maintain the unity. There are forces at work that don't want us to get on. There are forces at work that will come and try and bring division. And I've experienced them from time to time, and I think most of you have. And if you haven't, you will. But recognise that our fight is not with flesh and blood. It's principalities and powers. They are the ones that want to bring division and strife. We, according to scripture, are to try and we are the ones that maintain the unity. We operate the principles that will maintain unity together. Another thing we are is we are sons of God. Whether you're a whether you're a female or a male, you're still in his eyes you're a son of God. All who did to receive him, he gave the right to be children of God of God and there's a sense that that's immediate but there's also a sense in that it's a progressive thing as well uh, Galatians 4 7 says we're no longer a slave but a son and a slave there's a totally different connotation to being a slave to what there is as a son we now function as his children a slave never had the rights in a home that a, that a child of that family had you, those of you who have a child, that child has, has the rights in your home because you're the parent. I could come into your home and I don't have the same rights in that home. 
I don't have the same freedoms. Why? Because it's not my home. But he's brought us into his home and he's given us all of these things. I'm going to whiz through them because I'm watching the time. We are clean. Jesus said we are now clean through his word in John 15, 3. We're through, clean through the word which I have spoken to you. It's a, the word was spoken and it was. Remember back in Genesis, God says, let there be. And the Bible says, and it was. Came into being. He's spoken into being the creative power of his words. And I tend to think we have a, an enormous creative power. The one we listen to the most is really the most important preacher in our life. Too often we say, you know, I can't do it. Well, Scripture says you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. I don't have a problem with coming to God and say, look, God, I feel that I can't do this. Nevertheless, according to your word, you say I can, therefore I know that you will bring me through this. You will do it. So we're clean through his word. 1 Corinthians 6.11 says that we are what? <coughs> Pardon me. It says we are washed. But it also says that we're sanctified. That's an interesting word, isn't it? Sanctified. Never heard that before. What does it mean? Well, it means we're set apart for a purpose. We have a destiny to fulfill. We used to sing a song in my early days as a Christian. I have a destiny I know I shall fulfill. I have a destiny it's written in God's will. I have a destiny. I can't remember how the rest of it goes. That's the best. Not an empty wish. There you go. I have a destiny. It's not an empty wish. For I know I was born for such a time as this. Out of all the time... We do think about it. Just think about it. I mean, the the chances of you being you, out of without going into the gory detail, the the unfertilized egg gets fertilized by one of so many thousands of sperm, and it creates you. The chances of it being that egg and that sperm, probably a million to one. And yet, that's what makes us uniquely us. If it had been a different one, you wouldn't have been you. I remember my, I um, had a friend who, who actually said to me, I wish I'd never come out to this country. I didn't want to come. My mum and dad made me come. And I said, well, I'm glad I came because if I hadn't have come, I wouldn't have met my wife and I wouldn't have had the kids that I've got and I wouldn't have had the grandkids I've got. They wouldn't have been them. I may well have had kids, but they would have been someone else. And I'm glad I've got the ones I've got. You glad the ones you've got you? Sometimes we're not, are we? Sometimes we think, oh, why do I ever have you? But uh, we don't voice it, but sometimes we think that. Oh, what have I done? But uh, there we go. But we're set apart. We have a destiny to fulfill. Quickly, I'm justified. This is going so good. This is a Bible word and it really means it's just as if I'd never sinned. When God looks at you, he looks at you as if you'd never sinned. How about that? Not our self-effort, but it's through his word, his word that he graced within us. There's no warrant out for us. We're not, there's no sentence that's pending. Where before we were, we were as sin as the wages of sin was what? It was death. But the gift of God is eternal life through him. It's a gift. Can't earn it. I've heard people trying to get rid of stuff in their life so they're good enough to come to God. What a tragedy. Because none of us are good enough. Sometimes I don't feel like I'm good enough to stand in his presence even now. But then I'm glad that I don't stand here. And what I feel, I'm glad I stand here as complete in Christ. That's what matters. We all fall short of his glory. Another important one is 1 John 4.10. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son 
to be the propitiation or the atoning sacrifice for our sins. I'm going to whiz through them. We're redeemed. Galatians 3.13. Christ has redeemed us from what? From the curse of the law. Our values have been restored. How? By his grace. He, he's just come into us. His grace has come into us. And we are redeemed. He's brought us back. He's restored us. We are righteous. Romans 5. By, for as by one man's disobedience, that is by Adam, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, that is Jesus, many will be made righteous. Through Adam's we became sinners. So often we focus on our shortcomings. And whilst I think that's an aspect of it, that the real thing that God dealt with, he dealt with the root of the tree. And that we were sinners by nature. It had nothing to do with what we did. It's what we were. And when we come to Christ through Christ, we then become righteous. He grafts us into a new tree. Now I've got some roses at home that have been grafted into a different rootstock. I don't know a lot about them, but I know they do that because there's a, it's a stronger rootstock. And I think what God's done is he's grafted us into his rootstock because it's a good one. And he wants us to, to grow and develop. Through faith in Christ we're made righteous or we have right standing with God. We now have the ability within us to, to live right. Does that mean we won't make mistakes? No, it doesn't mean that. In fact, 1 Corinthians 10.23 says this. It says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. We can do things that will not build us up. It's a bit like what I said before as to are there some things that we can do that will help us be aware of the presence of God? I think there are. There are some things that we can do in life that will help us to grow in God. I'm a, I'm a great one, those of you who know me, which most of you do, know that I'm, I'm an advocate for having a daily quiet time with God, a daily reading, a daily feeding time to feed my inner man. The more we feed, if we would feed our inner man as much as we feed the outer one, we would be doing pretty good. And, and I speak to myself in that too because we, we live in a world that it's hard to do that. And it's time for me to stop. But I could go on. I've got some other things in here. But um, I think the important thing to see is that you can do your own research. Have a look in scripture and, and have a look and see just who you are in Christ, what he's made you. Don't rely on me doing all the work for you. You, you do it. You only need a concordance or a Bible program. It's pretty easy now. So our life now, is, it's, our life's not a set of rules, but it is a life that has to have boundaries. You know, you, bringing your kids up, if you don't have boundaries for them, You'll have chaos in the house. And we need to have boundaries in our life. It's the old saying, we now have the liberty to do as we ought to do, not the license to do as we please. And I've heard people say, oh, don't, don't put me under law. Well, I've got news, we're all under law. But it's not the law of sin and death. It's the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. It's the law of love. That's the overriding, arching thing. And so... It's how do I outwork that in my life to bring life into a situation and to bring restoration, to bring some sort of manifestation of the heart of God into a situation? How do I do that? And I guess that's part of what we have to do. I'm going to leave it there um, because I've run out of time. Uh, I'll make a good evangelist ever long and never winded. Um, but let's just, I want to close with a, just a reading from Philippians 1, which is a very good benefit, benediction. And, and it was really a prayer of Paul to the Philippians. And, and I think it was appropriate for us. He said, this I pray, and this I pray, 
that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you might approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offence till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. God bless you all and um, have a great week. Look forward to hearing some really good testimonies next week. Amen.